Financing a vehicle, whether it be for personal use or for your Turo fleet, can be an extremely daunting task. How do you ensure that you're getting the best deal? How do you ensure that you get approved? What if you get denied? What are the different factors that are taken into account whenever a bank is qualifying you? These are a handful of the questions that many of us ask whenever we're going through the financing process. And the problem is there aren't enough answers to all of these questions that we all have. But I have some good news because today we're gonna to be answering a bunch of your questions that you've been asking me about how financing works when you're buying a car. Today we're going to be talking about PJ of Exotic Car Hacks. He's an exotic car owner, an exotic car investor, and he's the founder of Exotic Car Hacks, which is a method of buying cars, driving them for a few years, and then selling them for either a profit or break even. And it's a way for you to own exotic and luxury cars without losing any money. But that's not it, because PJ also has extensive background in vehicle financing. So we're going to be talking all about vehicle financing, how to get approved, and some of the best practices if you're somebody that wants to finance a car for personal use or for Turo. So without further ado, let's welcome PJ to the channel. All right, so we have Pejman Kadimi here, or PJ, and he is the mind behind Exotic Car Hacks. And first of all, PJ, I want to thank you for being here at the channel. I'm, I'm really excited to have you. Well, I'm excited to be here because you're one of the smartest people I know on YouTube. I mean, after that Carvana video, I've said it, I know, to you offline, but that was one of the best explanation of how dealerships have shady practices, and I love people who are raw and direct to the point. So I'm, I'm very honored to be here, Aubrey, and whatever I can do to help your audience, I'm happy to. Thank you. Well, well, my audience appreciates it. I appreciate it. And I would love to kick off this, this conversation by giving you an intro and, and allowing for you to talk about you know, who you are, what your background is, but of course, the, the background behind exotic car hacks as well. Sure. So, I mean, in short, I basically in 2005 invented an algorithm that allowed me to basically forecast exotic car values uh, and, their, and their futures. And I created a fund out of it called VIP Motoring back then, where I basically collectively crowdfunded to buy incredibly expensive seven-figure cars. And at the time, I was rich, but not that rich enough to own a fleet of my own and so on and so forth. And so that business grew uh, to over $400 million a year in revenue, which was fantastic, uh, and basically had its livelihood for like 10 years. Uh, it, about six, seven years after I kind of founded that, I started realizing that, you know what, there's going to be a lot of people playing in the exotic car space. It was very different back in 05 versus it is now. Uh, manufacturers are make a lot more cars. And I realized that this business model wouldn't be one that would last very long. But I saw the value in what we had created and this ideology behind how to forecast car values, what's going to depreciate, what's not going to depreciate, and basically how to drive exotic cars and hypercars for free, which is ideally what I had been doing since I was in my very uh, late teens and early 20s. And having grown up very poor, everybody always wondered, how do you drive a 911 Turbo at 20 years of age or a uh, Ferrari Modena or Gallardo at the time? At 22, they were like, what, what the hell do you do? You know, at the time, the internet wasn't that dominant as it is now. So a lot of there was a lot of uh, confusion about how I did that. And really, what I was doing is just using my own algorithm, you know, which later became that business. And one of the things that occurred years later is I decided, I said, you know, maybe the, the whole investment model of this uh, on a crowd basis isn't necessary. One, because I had a lot more money then and I just decided to do this on my own. Two, the other part was also that I felt like there was a real opportunity, not just to invest in cars, but also drive them and enjoy them, you know? And so I built basically a way for people to do this at home themselves. I said, instead of me investing for you in cars, well, do it yourself. I'll teach you how to read these values and so on and so forth. And we started a, a platform called Exotic Car Hacks, which at the time was basically a course that would teach people how to basically buy a car and make sure they break even or make some money at the end of their ownership. People used to say, well, that's a car flipping course. And I used to say, no, because we teach people how to use the car during the entire duration of ownership, which is the difference between a dealer. A dealer buys a car and expects to flip it immediately, not changing the condition or the usage or the mileage of the car. But we intend to buy a car as enthusiasts and use it, enjoy it for a year or two, and then get rid of it, hoping to still break even despite the usage increase. So it was a very different model, and it led to first uh, a couple of thousand people joining the community over the first few years, and then it kind of blew up. People started realizing that this is more of a financial course and a financial element rather than a car flipping course, and over time, it became a large community now that nears almost 20,000 members, uh, and it's pretty exciting to just be able to teach people 
the art of trading luxury assets uh, and use them uh, without losing any money. And I have this slogan because we do this with watches and cars, which is basically that uh, most people uh, get rich to, to buy stuff. You know, they get richer so they can afford more stuff. And we get richer buying stuff. So we can still have all the things we want, but we get richer doing it instead of losing money or only accumulate wealth to spend it. So I, I consider it a more wealth preservation strategy that combines, you know, very strong financials with an understanding of the automotive and, and luxury asset markets. And that's basically what I do today, uh, all on the internet. And I'm also the douchey guy you see all over Netflix and other people <laughs> making fun of people who drive crappier cars. And I'm, I'm called an a-hole for that <laughs> everywhere, but it is what it is. You know. <laughs> I think it's very, very cool what you do. And, and to give kind of my audience, especially the ones that may not be familiar with you, the brand and Exotic Car Hacks Method, can you give some examples of some of the cars that you have purchased over the years and, and maybe like what the, the financial situation was on breaking even for those if you were able to make money? Could you give some examples to that? Yeah, I mean, I've owned over 300 plus cars personally over the last like wow. 15 years now. I know it's a lot. It's crazy, right? And I've probably purchased now, I would say over 5,000 cars, like, like bought and sold either through dealer transactions, brokering or anything else. So I have an extensive knowledge of the ins and outs of cars. But personal cars in my collection include cars like P1s, uh, Senna's, SVJ's, uh, SF90's. I have multiple STO's, uh, multiple Ford GT's, new and old, etc., cetera, and a, and a collection of other cars personally. A recent hack I, I established for myself is I, had, I have two Senna's currently. I just sold one of them. I had purchased one for a million, just sold it for a million, 130. After a year of full usage, most people park their cars, never use them, look at them as trophies. I used the crap out of my Senna an entire year, still made 130 grand on the car after a whole year of usage. Uh, wow. But, I, you know, at the beginning, before I had enough money to buy seven figure cars, etc., I was still doing this with R8s, Gallardos, you know, cars that basically you could get in uh, on a normal basis at 110K uh, and drive for two years and then sell for 115K. While someone would argue, well, you only made five grand, the intent was never to make money. The intent was basically to still have the usage and the enjoyment of owning an R8 for multiple years and be able to make five grand instead of lose 30 grand. Yeah. What most people don't realize is that exotic cars appreciate 10, 18% a year. So if you, like right now, I have a, a Rolls-Royce Ghost and a, and a Bentley GT and a Lamborghini Urus that I use as, uh, as daily drivers in rotation. And a normal conventional buyer would lease these cars and lose 18 to 20% a year every year. So each year they own these cars, they would lose 50K, 30K, you know, 20K, depending on the car cost. And then this would follow true. And that's why exotics have always been known as depreciating assets. And, you know, there's, there are things you don't want to buy because they're liabilities. But reality is times have changed and exotic cars have changed. And now I'm able to drive these three cars on a daily driven rotation. So adding three to 5,000 miles a year on each and still break away completely clean and lose nothing and still have driven a million and a half of incredible cars as daily drivers, you know? And so this works mm -hmm. on BMW M3s or BMW 3 Series as much as it can work on exotics. But the model is mainly geared towards hard to get better suited exotics, but it can still be applied to luxury cars as well as performance luxury cars like M-Powers, AMGs, et cetera. So I'm glad you mentioned that. And so what my channel is really mostly about is, is Turo and the used car market. And so there's a heavy focus on these more entry level cars or on the high end, like these kind of kind of mid-entry luxury cars. And so very rarely on my channel do I talk about cars that are are nearing $100,000 in purchase price. And in talking to you know you and your team and something I've talked about a lot on this channel is buying exotic cars for the purpose of Turo isn't necessarily a good idea. But what could be a good idea is buying luxury cars for the purpose of Turo, especially if you can buy those luxury cars at a good price. And so can you talk a little bit about how this method that you've used to buy these million dollar cars, how they can be also used for these more, more modest luxury cars that are maybe 75,000 and under. Well, you know, our, like I said, our strategy is broken down into two concepts, exotic car hacks and luxury car hacks. So the luxury segment can work very well here. And I'm glad you said that you don't recommend doing exotics on Turo, and I wouldn't recommend it either. There's a very delicate algorithm when it comes to cars being crashed, excessive mileage, abuse and everything that can cost heavily uh, on the exotic depreciation curve. 
which is why we'd never recommend doing like high-end exotics on Turo, even though the idea may seem exciting because most people don't have a reach of a Ferrari Pista or something, and to put one on Turo would get a lot of attention. Uh, the cost basis of owning such a car would never be offset by the type of abuse that would come from the uh, rental of such a pristine car or something that exciting. Uh, on the other front, though, luxury cars, especially if you know your tour market, may make a lot of sense, right? Because most people want to rent something they don't own or something better than what they own at home. And usually if you have like an S-Class or something like a 5 Series uh, or something that can be bought used in the 50 to 70K range, it's probably very popular. And I'm sure cars like Corvettes and things are also popular and so on and so forth. So one of the uh, strategies or how you can really use exotic car hacks to do that is by basically purchasing a car that's already taken uh, the majority of his depreciation from time. And the only thing that's left is to take his depreciation from mileage. So, you know, if you actually look at our strategy for luxury car hacks, we have something called the bottom mileage value, which basically calculates, it's a formula that calculates what should the mileage be of a car of this age today? And has its time factor already expired where by the time you add the miles, the timing won't impact the depreciation, only the miles, but you're only driving up the miles back up to where it should be. So let me explain that in a simpler way because that sounds confusing. So if a car has basically 12,000 miles today, but theoretically based on its usage formula for that luxury car segment, maybe it's Mercedes and that formula is 3,000 or 8,000 miles a year, whatever it is, you would calculate that into the years of existence say by now this car should have 24,000 miles. Each and every make and model is different. But with the luxury car hacks course, we basically teach you how to calculate that. But let's say it was 24,000 and you found this car having 17,000. Well, using our formula, you can basically negotiate that car to, to the, like where you're not paying a premium for it having lower miles. And you can basically buy it as if you were buying one of higher mile value. So by buying the actual car at this point at the lower price that we teach you how to do that with, you're buying essentially almost like 7,000 free miles of usage. And that's where the Turo equation comes in because you could say, well, I can rent this now in Turo for 7,000 miles and the cost basis of the car, unless it was damaged or crashed really badly, would not really change. So by doing this, you could not only leverage making money on Turo, which is fine because you're renting your car, but there wouldn't actually need to be a significant level of depreciation on the car itself. So basically, it's almost like I bought this car for 50 grand. I can leverage it for 7,000 miles on, on Turo. But then when I sell it, usually you would expect to sell it for 40 because it has more miles and now you're losing 10, but maybe you made 20 grand from Turo. So now there's an offset. But in this case, you could actually sell it right away for like 49 and lose only one grand for the additional usage. So giving you a significant larger profit pool to use uh, going forward in terms of like new cars that you bring on the fleet, et cetera. Because the main thing is that, you know, basically Turo is, is you're offsetting the loss on the car by the usage of it, or you're offsetting the usage of the payment. If you like, if you're financing the car and the payment's $1,500, it's just like a house rental, right? You're saying, mm -hmm. hey, my mortgage is X, I can Airbnb my house six times. That would basically mean that I make my mortgage and I'm good. You know, I live there for free. Well, it, the argument works in the housing market because we expect housing to keep going up. Mm -hmm. So we don't expect our, our monthly charges in the house to basically uh, leave us with an asset that is worth less later. We expect the asset to go up. Now, if we can stabilize the asset with Turo by getting a luxury car that fits this model, we can literally almost double our profit margin in the other side because we're not losing on the asset itself. We're only making money while literally borrowing the asset if we're even financing it. If we're going to a bank and saying, here's, seven, you know, here's 50 grand for the car and we're not even using our own money. Uh, and in many cases, you can do that because luxury cars, the ones that we specifically teach people how to use, uh, are the ones that the banks look at as lower value than their books. So basically, mm -hmm. like the LTV, uh, if you kind of follow what I'm saying, I know you have a, but you also understand finance really well. But the, the loan to value on that specific uh, car would be so beneficial for the bank to finance almost at 100%. So you wouldn't literally be spending anything other than interest on the loan uh, since the value of the car doesn't change either. 
Okay. So you're, so just like a kind of a general summary, just to make sure that myself and my audience understands is the idea is to buy cars that have been underutilized from a mileage standpoint. That way there's Mm -hmm. kind of a gap that needs to be made up until that car reaches that true value of what it would be at. And then without paying a premium at the purchase, just to add that. So we're buying the underutilized car without paying a premium for that. Cause it's easy to say, I have found the car that has 17,000 miles instead of 24,000. But it's not easy to say I found a car at 17,000 miles that is also the same price as the car is at 24,000 miles. Very true. And yet I am not paying a premium for that lower mileage, right? Yeah, absolutely. And then, and then whenever it comes to the financing aspect, because of these, because of these fact that these cars are undervalued, you're able to get the financing fairly easily because it's not seen as a risky transaction on behalf of the bank. Exactly. And at a higher LTV than you would in a normal car simply because the bank sees that as a great asset that is undervalued and that they're, they would have financed 80,000 of that car, but you're only taking a 50K loan because you're buying it right. And so okay. they look at that and go, well, the value on the book is 70, 80K. This guy's paying 50. I don't need him to put 30K down or anything. It just doesn't matter. He can, you know, he can even finance in his taxes if he wants. You know? Whenever it comes to this type of, of business model, does the daily wear and tear have a pretty big impact? Because I would imagine that it, that could have a pretty... A, a, like, especially in the context of Turo, it could be pretty impactful because, you know, people don't care about things that don't belong to them. And so it's like daily door dings, rips in the leather, doing things like that. Is that something that can be detrimental to the ability to sell this car back at break even? So in any, in any scenario, the condition of a luxury or exotic car does matter in its resale. But, you know, I've always said that if you're running a tour business or any type of business in the auto industry, You have to consider it a business. So you have to have resources to touch up, you know, like damaged leather to to fix door dings without paying retail costs on that, right? Like meaning you're Mm -hmm. not going to uh, doordingmaster.com and saying, you know, I pay $300 a ding. There's eight dings in my car, charge me two grand, you know? So you're, you're really having resources to fix these things because that's how you intend to use it as a business, right? Uh, if, however, uh, like in terms of are they durable or do they last, I think it's very clear that there are some cars that are more delicate than others from a wear and tear standpoint that would not make as much sense to use on a tour basis. An example of that, a clear example would be you could rent out a BMW M5 or you could rent out a Maserati Quattroporte GTS. A Maserati Quattroporte is more prone to damage from being left in the sun the leather warping and the dash coming off and things like that. The buttons getting sticky because they're basically the same glue used by Ferrari on their buttons. So Mm -hmm. the more car sits out, the more it's used, the more people get in and out, the more little things are going to break and it costs money to fix. But more durable cars like BMW M5s are built from the same trash they built 5 Series from. So it's not like it's like that different of a car. It just has more power, but it's not really like a completely re-engineered car. It's usually made from the same leather things that other things could be. But an example of that that would be maybe more direct would be if you're renting out an Escalade, for example, the new Escalade, you could have a platinum model with leather, or you could have a non-platinum sport model where the average person wouldn't know the difference. And that model would have leatherettes, which is much cheaper and easier to actually maintain. Good knowledge of the cars is going to be required to really understand what fits the audience you're renting out to. You know, if you're renting out Escalades to rappers and people are going to use them in music videos where you're going to have girls with heels in the cars or things like that, it's probably not in your best interest to buy the most fully loaded epic Escalade, you know, like with everything else you need inside if the inside is going to get trashed. So you have to make, I think, a good balanced decision about why, why are you buying it and who will you rent it to? And, and the system works, listen, regardless that you're buying a platinum or a regular one. So that doesn't change anything. Okay. That's a, that's a great point. And so really kind of balancing that, that buying under value, underutilized car, and then balancing it with the durability of that car as well to find that perfect match. Mm-hmm. And so one thing I'd love to pivot to, especially because you have such an extensive background in, in vehicle finance, is to talk about that a little bit more, because I know one question that I get asked all the time is, how do you how do you get your foot into the door of financing vehicles, specifically in, in the context of Turo, where you're wanting to do it for your business? And this is definitely a pain point for a lot of people that watch my videos. And so can you talk a little bit to how, like whether you're, you're buying a car for Turo or you're buying a car for the exotic car hacks method, can you talk a little bit about how, or 
how you would recommend for somebody to to kind of get their foot into the door of financing their first car? So the the number one reason why most people uh, can't get financing right away is because they look at financing from I have a credit score and therefore I'm entitled to financing. So if I have a 700 credit score, well, that's a good score. So why is a bank not giving me $80,000 for a car? I should be, you know, I should be that guy that gets that loan and I don't understand why it's not working out. And reality is banks look at three key things in, in making a decision to uh, finance a person for a luxury or exotic car. First off, they, they take in consideration the fact that this is a leisure automobile, meaning it is not a Honda Civic. It is not a necessity to get to work. It is a luxury above that. So what they look at is they look at your credit score and they don't like credit scores under 650. Like they just don't like them. Like they will try their best to basically cancel you out from a luxury purchase under 650, you know? So, you, you know, you look at 650 as kind of the minimum expectation a seven as kind of the entry point. And then you want to look at the two things that most people don't pay attention to, which is they look at your income, not just how much money you make, but how you make it. You see, a lot of people think if they make X amount of money, the bank will just consider that their income. And they're like, well, I make 200K a year, so I'm worth 200K a year. And that's not always true. You see, a bank looks at the longevity and the capacity to repay based on the industry you're in. So the bank loves a doctor that makes 200K a year, but hates an internet marketer that makes 300K a year. So they will look at that and say, well, the doctor is guaranteed to have a job for 20 years. The internet marketer next year could be, you know, like picking up garbage or working at a mm -hmm. restaurant. I don't know, like how likely he is to be doing this forever, you know, or like if this is a fad or not. Yeah. So usually if you have a profession they understand, they will typically give it more weight. If you don't, you really have to back it with proof that you've done it for two years and that there's a real logistical paper trail of how you make money. You know, you're not just saying you make 300K, but on paper, you're making $12,000, you know, like, so, so they look yeah. at that. And the last part, the last thing most people don't know they look at is what did you drive before the car you're applying for? So this is the number one reason they decline loans. If you go from, I never owned a car, financed a car. Well, now I want a Ferrari. They go, okay, well, you put up 50%. If everything else works, you put up 50 cents on the dollar. We'll put up the other 50 and we'll make it work. Most people don't have 50 cents on a 500K loan, you know, to put down a 200K yeah. payment. It's just crazy, right? So they basically go, if you don't have skin in the game, we're not putting our skin in the game. So the way they look at it is they basically tier it under 40,000, under 100,000, and under 200,000. Those are the three tiers banks look at. Under 40,000 is your easiest to get approved for. And if you meet this tier and can make your payments for six full months, the bank will usually up you to the second tier, which is okay for you to upgrade to a car that is in tier two, which is under 100,000. Now, a way someone can get away from that and say, hey, I want to go straight to an $80,000 car is to make sure their loan size is still under 40,000, even if they want to offset that with a down payment. So they might say, hey, I've saved 20 grand. I want to buy a $60,000 car, so I'll put 20 down and still finance 40. If the trigger doesn't get past 40, most banks will be much more lenient on tax returns or income verification and first time approvals than they are if you go to a 60, 70, 80K car. Now, once you go past the 100K car, they want to see at least 12 to 24 payments ever made on cars that were under that. And then it's very easy to scale up. Like I've taken this one student, his name was Joaquin. I took him from, I've never owned a car at 19 to by 24, having a $650,000 SVJ because each year I basically upgraded him from, from one Lambo to another. But his first Gallardo, he had to put 50 cents down. You know, so he had to put 50% mm -hmm. of the dollar down. And then on the second car, he put 20% down. On the third car, you know, he put 10% down. And then by the SVJ time, like four years later, he was basically in a near 700K car with zero down. And it just came wow. down to just seeing the payments, not getting out of a car too early, and then also being very careful to understand that you can't be late and you can't make mistakes on a luxury asset payment because the bank will look at that as, hey, we're taking a chance on you and we want to see how you're behaving when you don't have to own something, but you want it. Will you lose interest in paying for it when you don't want it anymore? You know, if it's not the shiny new toy, will you be like, well, I don't want to pay for it? Or will you take it seriously and be like, this is my obligation till the car sold? Uh, so that's, these are like some of the best practices to one, make sure that you're, you're stating your job clearly. So a lot of times when people go and apply for jobs, like apply for loans, they'll write, 
I'm CEO of a company. And the company doesn't even exist. You know, like, yeah. it's, like no, it's just a, I'm CEO. It's just of like company. my company. <laughs> yeah, BS company number one or whatever. So it, what happens is the bank, that's a red flag. And they'll automatically say, okay, this person is not income worthy. So then they'll look at the other two things. And if one of them is not perfect, they'll be like, all right, we're not, we're not even looking at that. That's one of the reasons a lot of, uh, a lot of applications are auto declined by systems is because they look for trades they understand. So even if you are, for example, the CEO of your company, just putting down that you're the director of sales or the director of like, or CTO instead of a CEO will prone a manual review of the application rather than an immediate decline. Like if you're a 22 year old and you're CEO, you're automatically fucked. You know? yeah. <laughs> so then that's actually a great point because I, so my fiance and I bought a, or it, it's his car, but we bought it together is he got a GT 500 back in May. And we were actually looking to buy a Lamborghini Gallardo and we couldn't get approved for exactly what you're saying is um, up until then, the largest loan we had ever had was 25,000. And so, and I wasn't willing to put down 50%. And so it, it the past vehicle history was a big deal. But then I also think that possibly what you're saying with like the, I don't know, I can't recall what we put on the application, but it wasn't just like a regular, regular job title. I think we might've done something like internet based. And so if you are somebody who has a job that would be considered less safe to a bank, what do you recommend doing? Do you recommend just like lying on the application kind no, of I, closer? No, what do you recommend? No, lying and, and, and just being clear are two different things, right? Mm -hmm. so, so for example, you hold, like there's a certain type of something you do in your job that isn't just CEO, right? Or generic yeah. that way. Like, like maybe you're, for example, uh, as an example, maybe you're marketing, right? Like the mm -hmm. word marketing is a red flag, but advertising is not. Does that make sense? So, okay. so, so like there are ways to basically condone what you like, share what you do in a more black and white way to a bank. And, okay. and the point that I'm trying to make is if you don't have at least two years of clear tax returns, you know, showing that you're mm -hmm. profitable and, and it's matching what you're saying, uh, using these key terms is definitely going to help you at least get a manual review rather than an automated decline. So, so the argument here is not to lie. The argument is to ensure you're clear in your response and you're not generic in like, oh, Facebook marketing, like, like that's, yeah. you're, you're done, you know, like, it's basically like you're worth nothing. So you, you have to show longevity, and you have to show expertise is basically where it comes into, uh, and, and how it will help. Like, if you're doing a lot of tech in your business, writing, you're the CTO of your business is not a lie either. You know, you mm -hmm. may be both acting CTO and CEO, but the keywords that trigger is that the age is just too young for president, you know, owner, or, you know, it, it, and it automatically triggers the need for an income verification. Actually, uh, contrary to what most people believe, I'll tell you one of the biggest scams in the, in the car industry for the last 10 years, when you went to finance in a franchise dealership, you know, you enter, the guy would ask you like, what do you do? And I'm going to put in your, how much do you make? And while you're saying something, they were putting something else in the computer. If you actually like read what they printed for you, you know, like when you were like signing your application, you're like, yeah. oh, I didn't tell you because the guy was like, well, I know how to get you approved, you know? Yeah. So for a long time, they're basically getting you approved and you're saying something and he's like, well, I just it's heard just going that. one ear and out the other. Yeah, that's what I'm writing. I mean, you, you wrote the here, do you make 82? I wrote 92. You know, that's what I heard. And you're like, wait, that's not what I said, you know, but you don't read it. You're just like, oh, I signed the application. That's what I told you. And I was approved and I was good to yeah, go. They don't read later. <laughs> Very interesting. I remember so when I was a kid, like I, I, I applied for this one car. It was a Merce Lago at the time and it was expensive. It was like 400 grand. And what was really funny is that the, I remember when I, I told the guy, I said, hey, I make like 20K a month. And he wrote on the application that I made 600K a year. So I was like, so I looked at the application and I was like, what is that? It was like, oh, it's a typo. Don't worry about it. You don't do it correct. <laughs> And I was like, okay, but like in the end, that's what went in the computer, you know? And that, that was really funny. It's just how they got to making sure people get approved, you know? And like, they, I mean, they did this in the loan side on homes too. That's how we got in 2008. Yeah. You know, everybody's just saying, whatever your stated income is, is what you make. And it's like, I'm a cab driver that makes like $300 million. Okay, here's a $800 million dollar home. Good. Yeah, there you go. Goodbye. And so in your experience, does does having that, that, just knowing how to kind of work the system in your favor and then having that that 
equivalent loan history, is that almost more important than how much you make? Because like you mentioned your student that has the the SBJ, and I, I can't even fathom the amount that you would have to make to be able to justify that expensive of a purchase. But does it really come down to that at the end of the day? So it, it comes heavier on that than you think. So banks okay. look at what we call credit profiles more than they look at just income and score. Mm -hmm. so, so they look at, are you the person we want to put in this loan heavily? Like if you look at Woodside Credit or some of these large creditors that focus heavily on luxury and exotic car mm -hmm. segment, they're not really looking at, do you have the best credit score or like, you know, like how much money do you make? You make 10 million versus 2 million versus this. They really look at, are you the person we want to put in that car? And the way they do that is everything from your home, your address, you know, your home ownership, your priorities, they look at that. They go, hey, where does he live? Let's Google that address. Okay, uh, this address seems to be in an apartment where the car is going to be parked outside. Okay, like in a bad, heavily, uh, like there's a lot of robberies in that area. You know, okay, this person probably shouldn't be driving this car. Like it's just a bad idea for them to drive a very rare piece to park it outside with no parking garage and security, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's it's automatically a wrong profile you know what i mean like it just doesn't yeah. fit the narrative of what you probably should be doing and, and a big part of it is using ai and if banks have done this they've used ai basically to to gather this profile with an instance of you submitting an application so they instantly know like what is the likeliness of us maybe extending past their comfort zone here in a risk factor is that the right person we want to do that for like, you know, like I, I've gotten loans that are like a million on a car, no income verification, like nothing. They don't even like ask me, like, what do you do or anything? Because the profile is so strong because I've owned so many exotic cars. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've had car loans for 200, 300, 400, 500, you know, in the past. Yeah. So now it's very easy and I always put skin in the game. You know, they can see my address is like in a huge affluent neighborhood, you know, like, so they look at these things and they go, he's the right profile. He already owns 10 cars. It's unlikely he's ever going to default on this. You know, like mm -hmm. not only that, but our investment is pretty safe because look, he's got a collection of cars. What is the likeliness that he's going to take a Bugatti and put it in a wall? You know, or like yeah. cash it. He's had a perfect driving record. He has perfect insurance. He doesn't have the general insurance, you know, like he has State Farm or like a big, you know, name insurance company. So like once you start doing that, you start looking at the overall 360 approach of a, of a person's need or, or reasoning for owning a car. And if it makes sense, the bank may say, you know what, we usually do loans for 200K, but this seems like a really good portfolio profile for us. You know, like we'll go 500 for this person and, you know, we'll add on a half a percent rate. And, and since we know there's no default here, it's just easy money for us. You know, this is easy mm -hmm. to, to kind of make. But also don't forget that banks make money on, on defaults and, and bad credit profiles because yeah. they like interest rates. The problem when you deal with high dollar assets is that the opposite happens where they have to protect the asset, right? And if their credit profile doesn't match, now there are two problems. They don't really, they can't really repo a crashed Bugatti. So it's not a mm -hmm. good, like it's not really a good model, you know, like yeah. it's going to be like a loss. And at the same time, it's, it's probably the wrong person to lend to, even if their interest rate is high. So you have a double loss for the bank rather than a win. So once you get into luxuries, their tolerance for, for the credit profile matters just as much as uh, how much money you make or that you have a good credit score or not. Okay. And then I guess my last question for you is for somebody that's wanting to get started with financing cars, and again, whether it be to eventually work up to exotics or to eventually eventually own a fleet of vehicles, whatever the case is, what would kind of be the the number one piece of advice that you have for somebody that's wanting to get into that space through financing specifically? So how to actually get in financing? You mean like or I'm sorry, how do, like if you're wanting to use credit to build either a fleet of cars or to eventually get to the point where, you know, they're in a position like you where they have a fleet of exotic cars, what would you recommend them doing as their like first and second step to really get their foot into the door of, of putting themselves in a position to do that? So, so my, my logic on, like, on financing cars is once, you, once you're talking about fleets and, and you're talking about a full business, like we're not talking about getting two cars, but we're talking about getting 10, 15 cars maybe or having even like limo service with S-classes, you know, on Toro or mm -hmm. et cetera. You, you start to look at this as a business model that requires investor capital, not finance from a bank. Okay. If we're talking about one or two cars, like you're going to Toro two cars, try to make revenue while you own two cars too, you know, for your own usage, et cetera. 
then those instances may make more sense. But most banks will cap you at two cars. So you can't just go two cars here, two cars elsewhere. Once a bank sees you have more than two cars financed, your credit profile goes way down. Your risk really? goes way, way up. So usually a bank will easily finance one car, maybe a car like a second car at a separate bank, you know. But once you, they start seeing you have two to three cars and you don't have a reason for it, it's going to scare them. If they actually see the cars on Turo or can see that you have a Turo profile as well and you have multiple cars, that will also scare them and they'll probably decline. Yeah. Them. So because they don't like that. They don't like the idea of renting out their assets to leverage them, right? Like because they're mm -hmm. their assets, you don't own them technically. So the best thing to do is to do this on your first car. Basically pick a car you're going to use yourself, finance it as if you're a normal person and then tour it on the weekends or whenever you don't use it. If you're going to do a second car, put some skin in the game so the banking decision is easier. Like maybe you put 30% down or something so that it shows that it's going to be easier for them to lend on it. And then it, once you go third, fourth, fifth, sixth cars, you're going to need to think outside of conventional banking as a finance element because you're also risking your personal credit doing that. This is mm -hmm. one of the, the key things I tell young guys that are like all about real estate wholesaling. And they're like, I'm just going to go like buy another house and another house and keep putting all this on my credit. And I go, well, do you realize that when you want to buy your personal house, ain't nobody going to lend you anything? You know, like they're like yeah. homes and they're all rentals. Well, that, that's the next one is going to be a rental too. And they're going to be like, that's not going to work. So a lot of times you have to realize that like you have to really balance out when it makes sense to seek perhaps financial partners if the business model is sound and solid, mm -hmm. putting your personal credit at risk by going through purchasing more than two cars and doing this full time as a business. I mean, it's very easy to find investor capital if a model is sound and scalable. Very easy. I've always said in America, I mean, money is free. Like, it's just a question of knowing where to go look for it. If you have a sound model and have proved for a year that you're making good money, good decisions, and you're able to create a profitable model, and you need an extra 100 grand or 200 grand to scale up four cars, uh, I mean, it's better to get four more cars and get 50% of that money than no cars and no money, right? Mm -hmm. so, so to bring on a financial partner that can support uh, your financial expansion is very easy to bring on a financial partner to start up a business is very difficult because there's no mm -hmm. concept, there's no proof, there's nothing. But if you said, hey, I have 12 cars, I'm doing X amount of money, I have the perfect way to expand to 20 cars, I need a 200k loan, and I can see that on paper, you're not like cheating all your taxes and everything, yeah. legitimately building a real business, that's a very easy conversation to raise like 200 to, to half a million in capital. Very, very easy. And I would highly recommend if you're doing more than two cars to consider those options first. Very interesting. Well, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I think that that's a, a really fascinating way to go down. And I don't talk about the investor path a lot on my channel, but I think you're 100% right. And so um, I... I this, this conversation has been incredibly valuable. I, I really find both the exotic car hacks method, luxury hacks method, as well as just this entire finance discussion to be incredibly fascinating. And I appreciate your time. But before we, we sign off, is there anything that you want my audience to know where they can find you? Anything that you want to mention before we, we end the interview? No, if people want to learn more about exotic car hacks, you can simply go to exoticcarhacks.com. I'm sure you can link it for them in the description or anything Absolutely. else. Absolutely. See it. And we also have a luxury car hacks program. If you're more geared towards luxury cars for tour, that could probably be a better fit. And then uh, we can absolutely have that available for them as well. But the main thing is just remember that cars don't and no longer have to be liabilities. We're in a world now where everything can turn into an asset. You saw it during COVID. Everybody said oh my God, like cars are going to crash into 2020. The world is shut down. Everything's going down. The, uh, I remember one month before COVID hit and everything was on lockdown, I went and bought probably like $4 million in cars. And everybody told me I was insane and prices would get slashed and the end of the world's coming. And as soon as the country reopened, everything skyrocketed to the moon. And it, it's, a basics, it's, it's a basic principle that a lot of people got richer. And this has created new leverage in the exotic and luxury car space. And regardless that you're touring or not, you'd be a fool not to take advantage of learning new methodology and thinking around this conventional mindset that has kept people poor forever. Absolutely. Well, PJ, I appreciate your time. Thank you for being here. And uh, I, I'd love to connect at some point in the future and maybe do an update. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. Thank you.
But with that being said, you guys, I hope that you enjoyed this video. Now, I've said it a dozen times on this channel, and I said it throughout this interview as well, that I definitely don't recommend buying an exotic car for the purpose of renting that car in Ontario. I think it is far too risky, and I think there is way more downside than there is upside. But with that being said, I think that there is a time and place where you could buy a high-end luxury or an exotic car for personal use using the exotic car hacks method, or alternatively, you can use this method of buying cars to buy cars that are more suitable for Turo. So buying low-end economy cars, mid-tier cars, or even luxury cars like my Mercedes-Benz C300, for example. Money is made or lost at the purchase price whenever you're buying a car for Turo. So that is incredibly important to keep in mind. And if you keep in mind the things that PJ outlined throughout this video, I think that you will be well equipped to buy your next Euro car. But like PJ said, I will have all of the links to his channels, his course, everything you need to know down in the description below. So be sure to check that out. And like always, you guys, if you have any questions, comments, if you have anything to add, I would love to hear it. So make sure to leave a comment down below. And while you guys are at it, make sure to hit the like button, hit that subscribe button and hit the notification bell. And I will see you guys in the next video.